Will you zoom down, Dan? Or tilt down, sorry. Oh man, I can't, we're in no rush. Did we ever add the uh, drop weights? I don't think that we did. So we've just got, just got one. I wish I'd caught that. <laughs> yeah, I just saw him. It was a school of fish. Ooh. <laughs> okay, I'm on SPL now. Good morning. How are, are you guys all set up up on the front end? Getting there. Who could identify the school of fish that swam by? <laughs> Not I. And that's okay. Can anyone confirm if our depth was uh, 3,500? 3,500 meters. Expected Three. max depth, 3,552 meters. Is that what you wanted? Yeah. Expected depth at launch. Same thing, 3,552 meters. Let's turn on the bottle, then the camera, right? Oh, there was another fish. Oh, and another one. Already the most exciting descent. Definitely.
Oh, wrong one. So is this bottom left pip one one or yeah. cool? And what's two one? Got it. <laughs> oh yeah. Raj. We okay at 31? 30? Yeah, it actually... That is the fine adjustment mode. Yeah, you just knocked it down to tw back to 28 <laughs> below. <laughs> I think that's actually what's happening is that I lock it in at 30 and over time it just shifts just a tiny bit back. I wish we had like a
Comment section's back at it. Comment section's back at it. Are we ready to begin our discussions? Is that what's happening? I think so. Okay. Let's start with introducing ourselves. Um, okay. When you introduce yourself, please share. Mm. Share your favorite place to watch the sunset. Okay, that's a hard question. <laughs> Who's ready? Diane, do you have a favorite place to watch the sunset? Oh goodness, pick me, pick me. Okay, uh, so you share your I'll name. I'll think about it, yeah. Yep, you, yep. You share your name and your position title, and then I will um, say it in Hawaiian, your position, and then you can share where your favorite place to watch the sunset is. Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Diane. I am a science manager in training on the Nautilus, so this is my very first cruise. And she is a Kanaka Epikema slash Akiakamai. Thank you. And I love to watch the sunrise from the back deck if I'm able to be out there and there's not heavy equipment being moved around mm. because it reminds me of... Um, the summers I spent fishing in Alaska, like standing out on the back deck, getting ready to um, set the net. Wow. Yeah. Thank you, Diane. Yeah. Thank you. Awesome. Hi, everyone. My name is Ryan Gasparo. I'm a PhD candidate in biology at Temple University and helping out on the science team on this expedition. Um, my favorite place to watch the sunset um, it's probably just in my home state of Arizona where you get really spectacular colors that you don't tend to get other places. Awesome. Thank you, Ryan. Anybody in the front row want to go? Sure. Uh, my name is Paul. I am one of the ROV pilots, or Palaka Mukulu'u Kia Awaya, and um, one of my favorite places to watch the sunset is uh, just on the coast of San Diego near where I used to live. Um, we'd get really nice sunsets and yeah, just fond memories of that place. Awesome. Thank you, Paul. I forgot to mention that um, Ryan is a Kanaka Akiakamai and Epikema. Thanks. Kotachi. Hi everyone, my name is Kotachi. I'm the navigator, or Ho'okele. Uh, my favorite place to watch the sunset is right here in the middle of the ocean. Mahalo. Deanne or Jeff? Jeff, the video guy, um, and my favorite oops, sunsets, right? Is that what the question was? Yes. Okay. Uh, it would be probably about 900 miles north of Orion, or uh, Paul. Um, there's a couple little places on the Oregon coast where you sit out on the rocks and watch the sunset. Awesome. Thank you, Jeff. And Jeff, Jeff is a Kanaka Paivikio. I'm Dan, and sitting in the herd chair this morning. Favorite place to watch the sunset, uh, Sierra Valley, California. A little valley at 5,000 feet right in there. Crook of the Sierras, Beckworth Pass, uh, spectacular sunsets. Awesome. Thank you, Dan. Dan is uh, also a Pailaka Mokulu'u Kia Awaya. And uh, 
My name is Malanai Kane Kohivinui. I am a science. I am the science communication fellow for this watch. Um, in Hawaiian, that is a Komo Ike slash Mea Hai Mo'olelo. And my favorite place to watch the sunset is from any surf spot in the water, surfing. I like surfing at sunset. It's always nice to see the um, the sun kind of hit the water and create this glass of a wave that we get to surf on. Mm. Mahalo for sharing. Uh, let's see. Does does anybody else in our, in our group, I have a friend who the rule is, is from the time the sun touches the tip of the horizon till the time the sun slips below the horizon, no one can talk. should always be that way. So... We always have that. Wherever we are, from the time you hit, from the time it hits the horizon till the time it sinks below the horizon, everybody just has to chill. It's often like that here on the boat. Yeah. The last expedition we had, uh, Megan playing that. What is that instrument she had? Oh, many people were here. Um, I don't think anyone in this watch was in the last. Yeah, on the last expedition we had our navigator Megan had this very unusual instrument. Like, uh, anyway, she would play some really cool music uh, when possible at sunset. Very soothing, peaceful music. Hmm. Were there two Megans on the last cruise? Mm. It was. I think, yeah, maybe. Yeah. It maybe was Lubeckin. From Hawaii. Oh, no, yeah, I don't know. Megan cool. is uh, one of the um, University of Hawaii. She's part of the ROV team there, also a scientist. Cool. Awesome. Thank you, everybody. Um, happy Earth Day to you all. Happy Earth Day. Happy, Happy Earth, Earth Day. Day. Earth Day is every day. Yeah? Yeah. I guess today's extra, extra Earth Day. Most of the habitable, volu habitable volume on Earth looks like just what we're seeing right now. Blue water. Oh, yeah. That uh, definitely depends on your definition of habitable, right? Mm. I guess there are microbes in the atmosphere. Oh, I'd, yeah, I meant in large part for us. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Oh, right. I just mean habitable by anything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, we can now see where Ryan's thought is, is at. <laughs> that would be some interesting math. So if, uh, what is it, 70 some percent of the planet's covered in ocean? Something like that, yeah. So the 20 some percent that's remaining on land is flat, or it's, you know, some thickness, right? Mm -hmm. Compared to the ocean, which is habitable, you know, thousands yeah. of meters. Yeah. What's that, uh, what's that comparable biomass wise? Or if you take all the biomass in the very thin layer on land, yeah. and then take all the biomass in the ocean, What's that number? What's that percentage look like? Someone's definitely done this. Let me see if I can find an answer. The um, Mesobot team in the Twilight. What is it? The Twilight. The Twilight Project. Yeah. <laughs> Exploring the areas of. They're trying to define. What that habitable. is, yeah. You know what what the what the biomass is and different different areas. Alrighty, as Ryan is hunting away on. World Wide Web. 
Is there an easy way to tell the difference between a sponge and a coral? Or is it just practice? We seem to be able to call it out pretty quickly, what we see um, as we go along the bottom. Yeah, so um, sponges and corals tend to have pretty different body plans. On corals, you can see the actual polyp um, most times, which is this sort of characteristic morphology of a coral, um, with a lot of variation, of course, whereas a sponge typically is more like a mesh. Um, and yeah, a lot of it is practice, though, especially from afar, mm. um, just looking and seeing. I can, I can tell coral from sponge pretty quickly to the, to the point where it's just intuition. I don't even really think about it. Awesome. Thank you, Ryan. How about you, the RLV pilots? I feel like you guys are pretty good at um, seeing quickly the difference between a sponge and a coral. Do you guys have a, another way that you might be able to put into words on how to identify one from the other? Uh, yeah, we listen to the back row. <laughs> 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 if we uh, listen long enough, osmosis is bound to happen. <laughs> awesome. Thank so you. So you're filter feeding up there on the uh, front row is yeah. what you're yeah, saying? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Gotcha. Rennie actually is really good at, once he gets back into the groove, Rennie, Rennie I was beating Steve last time. And, Isn't that a blah, blah, blah? Why, why, yeah, I think it is. Sir, so, Rennie has spent a lot of time staring at these screens, that's for sure. Yeah, exactly. Oh, oh okay. So have you all. I'm getting there. And Dan, also, this is his fifth year on the Nautilus and my fourth so definitely a good chunk of time but not as much as some Paul have you ever worked with other pilots or do you and Dan always seem to work together how does that so Dan is actually one of the only people that has I've been on every single cruise uh, Dan has also been on. That said, I've never uh, had a shift with him yet. Um, so I've gotten, been very fortunate to do a lot of like the, you know, learn from him on the maintenance and um, like deck work with the ROVs. But uh, this is my first cruise getting a pilot with him. Nice. Go ahead. Hey, Data Lab. From Ontari, that question came from Ontari at Canada, and then we have an, another good. Ontario. 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 Thank you so much. I'm I'm so grateful for all the help that everyone. That, that that's all right. I butcher your language, so. I'm grateful for all the help that it, anyone can give me with pronouncing names. It's okay, your Hawaiian is way better than our Canadian. I'm going to be a good boy. Um, Ontario. There we go. Ontario, Canada. You're doing well. I, uh, I have to say that I have butchered so many scientific names so far in my dialogue over oh, yeah. here. So I'm always happy for the corrections as well. Uh, Oof, one day. Uh, there's so is. much to learn and know. Yeah, tell yeah. me the secrets. The secret is everyone butchers it, so oh, what? <laughs> it's all. <sighs> it's all good. Thank you. We have uh, another good morning message coming in from Texas. Good morning, Texas. Let's see who's tuning in. What countries are here with us today? We have the United States, uh, United Kingdom, Canada, 
Mm, Netherlands, Norway, Hungary. Nice. Germany, South Africa, Italy, India, Guernsey, Finland, Denmark, Brazil, Australia, Hawaii. Wow, people spending their Friday night and Saturday morning with us. That's pretty impressive. I know. Shout out to them. Woo. Yeah. yeah, that's pretty cool. Tell me more about your fishing trips in Alaska, Diane. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, let's see uh, where to start. So I fished for five seasons. It was salmon. Um, I fished on a 52-foot saner with a crew of six people off the Aleutian Islands. And um, I think the neatest thing about that is that you get to see Alaska and the coastline of Alaska in a way that you wouldn't in any other way. Um, just stunning, you know. There's so much coastline, and it's beautiful. Um, I can tell you one little snippet. I'll tell you a story. So fishing off the Aleutian Islands, the Aleutian chain there, if you look at a map of Alaska, the Aleutian chain kind of dips down, almost like a, a tusk of an elephant, if you want to think about it that way, like out into the ocean. And uh, sort of midway down that tusk is uh, an island called Unalaska. It's close to Dutch Harbor, if you've been around that area. And uh, that was one of the spots that we usually fished early season. Um, and sockeye typically come through in that part of the season. But also a lot of other uh, marine animals are, are moving around through that area. Everything follows the food, right? So um, whales come through there and pass through uh, nearby Dutch Harbor going up into the Bering. And um, there was a day we were fishing, and it wasn't going so well. We weren't catching a whole lot. And we kept seeing something moving on the coast. We were, like, about two miles off the coast. And, you know, things moving around. And we're like, ah, you know, I don't know what it is. And we're, like, looking through the binos and, like, trying to check it out. And at one point in time, the, my skipper was like, you know what? This is not even worth it. We're going to go in for a little bit and just kind of anchor up. And uh, as we get closer to the coastline, we see that it, uh, what is moving is actually about five or six groups of grizzly bears. Wow. Um, some are like mothers with cubs, some are solitary animals, but they're all kind of like moving and roving around in this like one area and just kind of churning up this one spot. We get a little bit closer and we get a little bit closer and it turns out that that is a whale carcass that has washed up onto the beach. It was a gray whale washed up onto the beach and these bears had come in to, yeah, get a nice meal. Um, so there were like groups of bears like all over this whale because it's a huge whale and say so they had each like staked out territory where they were like just ripping off hunks and like eating it and um, it was totally fascinating to see. Turns out like we found out later did a little bit of research um, the bears on that part of Unalaska are some of the largest grizzlies anywhere because they are so well fed. This is like a typical thing that happens. Like orcas may come along, kill off a gray whale, they eat some, the whale washes up on the beach, the, the bears eat the beached whale, and so on. So it's a whole like food chain kind of wow. a thing up there. That's crazy. Yeah. I am mind blown. Like that is awesome. Yeah. It was really neat to see. So a gray whale. Yeah. And they're all usually gray whales that wash up. Uh, there could be other types of whales as mm -hmm. well, but yeah. We did see orcas through there. Are they humpbacks? Do they ever? Um, are you ever afraid of the orcas that come by? Uh, you know, we had some come really close to our skiff, and if I were the skiff driver, I would have been a little bit nervous. <laughs> Are but they? you could hear them talking. Oh. You could hear them like making noises and like screeching and squealing and making. The noise comes out of the water and you can hear it? We can hear it. We also had like a, a little tiny rudimentary hydrophone that we would stick in the water just so mm. that we could like listen. I worked with an interesting group of people. They, um, uh, a little bit of a science bent to them. Um, the deck boss was a, a car, uh, what's a cartographer, but for a marine, there's a term. Anyway, he makes maps, and um, 
but he started out as a marine biologist and so yeah we were often like just doing like little experiments like that like sticking a hydrophone in the water and cool yeah it was really fun i'm loving this these stories yeah, what other adventures have you had <laughs> while the rest of us are still waking up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've been up since four, so I'm fully mm. caffeinated, ready to go, ready to yabber on and on. Welcome to story time with Welcome Diane. Welcome to story time with Diane. Everyone gather around, gather around. We've got plenty of blue water for story time. <laughs> totally. You can spend any time in Alaska, you can just, you can amass it. Alaska is a, a crazy a, number of stories. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You'll see things up there that you do not see anywhere else. Exactly. Diane, you want to sit in Dwight's chair for now? Um, yeah, I could I could pop over and give the data log chair to Fiona. I'm so, like, you've had so many adventures. I want to grow up to be like Diane. And she didn't, I don't know, can you hear what I'm saying? Not yet. I just said, oh, wait, can you hear me now? Nope, she still cannot hear me. Oh, perhaps you can. I can hear you now. I want to grow up to be like Diane. Oh, I don't know about that. I've changed <laughs> careers so many different times. Um, it's been a lot of fun, but uh, also, like, being a beginner over and over and over and over again uh, is a thing. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of different avenues to uh, get to where we are here on the ship, and mm -hmm. everyone has their role, like mm -hmm. communications here and local cultural liaison, liaison, science, ROV drivers, mapping, yeah, video guys, video guys, <laughs> yeah. So a lot of us have taken a uh, sort of a circuitous route to get here, and some of us have taken a more direct route, but yeah, so many ways to, to be involved in this, including even the ship's crew, you know? Totally, We've sure. We've got um, the mates, the ABs, the cooks and galley staff, stewards, so yeah, so many ways to get out here and be a part of this. Definitely. Meanwhile, we'll, uh, our communications team will be in and out of the studio, interacting with schools from all over. Is Fiona plugged in? Are you plugged in, Fiona? I'm here. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. I think, um, can we introduce ourselves and we said our name, our position, and we'd say the Hawaiian one, and then we shared sunset. We shared our favorite place to watch the sunset. Oh, okay. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Fiona. I am from the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands. I'm a student at the University of Guam, and I am an ocean science intern here at Nautilus. And my favorite place to watch the sunset is probably this place called Beach Road on Saipan. It's just this really long stretch of road along the beach, and um, it's facing the, the west side, so we get a lot of the nice sunset over there, so mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you, and Fiona is a haumana slash um, hu'ea'o. Aloha mai kako, my name is Ho'oipo Burnaman, um, and I am the cultural liaison on this trip. My favorite place to watch the sunset is this place called Lala Milo, um, where you can see both of the mountains where, where that is, and the mountains kind of turn like an orange, orangey mm. red at sunset. Mm. Mm. Beautiful. It Thank sounds you. lovely. Yeah. Awesome. Diane, if you want to go, don't feel pressured to stay. But I, you, you're very welcome to fill in that seat. <laughs> I'm just going to keep the, the chair warm for Dwight while he's uh, <laughs> doing a lot of other I know. Um, um, Dwight is 
is busy away trying to um, figure out our satellite um, functions and hoping to get our cameras working up real good for everyone that's tuning in from their homes. Yeah, we've had a little bit of difficulty with it kind of flickering and so people not being able to get a good look at some of the animals that we're seeing. And so yeah, that's been um, something that our, our team ashore has been working on and Dwight's been trying to communicate with them about issues here on the ship with it. So hopefully we can get that resolved. Yeah. Thank you guys for hanging in there with us as we... To be clear, the, there's no problems really on the ship. The cameras are all fine. Oh, yeah. thanks. All Jeff. our stuff is fine. It's just the it's satellite the, part. It's on, yeah. It's, okay. It's fine leaving the ship. Fine on the ship. It's, once it leaves the ship, then it starts to enter. Yeah. So we're working diligently to make sure that it gets fixed. Thank you, um, Jeff. We totally see everything amazingly here. Everything in the van looks fine. <laughs> it's once it's once it leaves the van, the world is. Where does it go? Yeah, awesome. Good morning from greetings from muddy Netherlands. Okay, okay. Have you witnessed um, bubble net fishing? So that's when that's when whales aggregate fish using the bubbles from oh. their mouths, and it's a very cool thing. I think it was on Blue Planet or something on the the Netflix show. Yeah. And it's pretty amazing. I've never had the opportunity to witness that. Have you? It's astounding. You've it seen is it. It's amazing wow. to watch. Wow. Yeah, yeah. I've seen it in Alaska, and then I've also seen it in the Antarctic, um, where they also bubble net feed. And one of the interesting things that some of the scientists have been doing in the Antarctic with their um, research on humpbacks is they've taken uh, small drones and flown over the bubble net feeding so that they can get like aerial photos, but then they can also get um, measurements of the animals, how many animals, what size they are, um, et cetera. And we do have like hydrophones also that we're putting into the water. And what you'll notice is that there's usually one whale that is orchestrating the bubble net feeding mm -hmm. and that, and so, essentially a group of whales will do a dance underwater and they're spiraling essentially oh, in no. the water um, around a grouping of, of krill or fish depending on where they're feeding and uh, trying to school that up so that when they come up and open their mouths like they like just scoop up like a mass you know yeah, and so yeah there's usually um, a one whale that's orchestrating and then there's another whale who's kind of keeping time in the background and like keeping everybody on point and so it's almost like a metronome oh you can in, hear in the background like, yeah the singing to yeah so that one will like sing and one will like kind of bark if you mm -hmm. want to think about it that way to keep time and then i'm not really sure and no one is actually quite sure how they, how they how they you know finally do the timing but they all lunge at the same time and like scoop up the krill towards the surface and like whoomp. and so sometimes you'll see their their um their mouths up on the surface, and just mm -hmm. like closing in, like boom, like 12, 13 whales. And you can think about that, like trying to orchestrate those uh, enormous bodies, you know, essentially mm. under the water and making sure that they're not like tripping over one another, or right. like, you know, for lack of a better word. That's so cool. That's incredible. Mm -hmm. Trying to translate those different roles to what we do on the ship. I'm I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> Who's the expedition leader there? Yeah. Who's singing? Who's barking? <laughs> you know. That's and then everyone cool. eating all at once. Yeah. I love that. Greetings from Friday Harbor. Uh, and then also, yes, we did. The arm was moving. It got a little stretch in there. Um, okay. <laughs> Are there any technical updates made to Hercules um, this year? Mm -hmm. You're still muted. What have we updated this year? Um, we've done some software updates. We have a new, uh, couple new sonars on the vehicle, multi-frequency um, Mesotech and um, a new Tritech. Uh, Seeking, which is the one between me and Paul here. 
which replaced the Sea Prince. Yeah, the Sea <laughs> Prince finally gave up the ghost. There's been uh, quite a bit of maintenance done on the vehicle. We've replaced uh, well, probably 50% of the quarter inch uh, hydraulic lines, a um, uh, bunch of the hydraulic components, uh, cross track pilot, pilot operated cross port check valves uh, for the port side manipulator and the extender track. There's been some uh, other hydraulic upgrades so that. Uh, flow restrictors and such that control the speed of the cameras, which an upgrade wasn't uh, as optimal as we'd hoped, <laughs> so we have some more parts on order for those to uh, hopefully make our main camera pan and tilt a little smoother. Awesome. What else was new to you this year, Paul? Uh, the HPU deck fill thing. Oh, yeah. We've done that. That's not on the vehicle, though. Yeah. Don't well, forget some major ones. Yeah, we've uh, has a new motor, new electric motor, new pump, uh, new hydraulic pump. So the engine, Herc's engine, is basically brand new this year. I'm doing really well. Touch wood. And the uh, hydraulic power unit that we use to uh, run it on on deck is uh, had some upgrades as well, so it's a bit more user friendly. <laughs> Quite probably go on and on. So uh, we have a running list of uh, upgrades and maintenance that we've have done or want to do or need to do. They have a priority scheme from uh, 1 to 10, and we kind of pick a number based on, well, the boss picks a number, the ROV manager, Josh. But we, we also get some input on, on um, how important we feel those upgrades are. So everyone has, um, and there's some of the engineers, uh, like Trevor is mechanical, and uh, Robert's the uh, electrical engineer, those. And then we have our, our beach support engineer, John Zan. So those, the three of those guys uh, have a huge influence on what upgrades will happen when. Our wish list, though. Yeah, what's top That's of your wish list? Top of my wish list is uh, high definition cameras. Mm. everywhere on Hercules. Oh, yeah. We have better cameras here in the control van than we have on like the, the with the exception of the Zeus, of course. Yeah, yeah. Interestingly, that's my wish list for the ROVs. <laughs> uh, the Zeus is, uh, it's hard to, hard to beat the image quality from the, from the main camera, but the, uh, the other ancillary cameras that, the back row or the, the audience doesn't really see are, um, uh, one of them is the original camera, which is our, our bubble camera, our, our pan and rotate camera we have on the front. So it, it's um, still got the 4 by 3 image. The rest are at least... Uh, I know there's still um, several of the tooling cameras that have a 4 by 3 image. That's why you see the black bars in the uh, smaller cameras there. We'd like to have high, high definition cameras for those. So. Yeah, so for anyone tuning in on Satellite Feed 3, you can see, you know, the image quality that we use for a lot of the operation stuff that we're not necessarily sending out all the time because it uh, doesn't look as nice. And also not, not much happens on them, but they're occasionally very important for us. Yeah, that right there is the uh, like the rear cam, which is um, really useful to keep the two in perspective because they're always attached by that uh, tether. So you can see, depending on which way the tether is going, um, 
where the vehicles are, even if you lose all other, you know, uh, telemetry or lose track of them or lose navigation. Yeah, lose navigation. Tells us uh, where Hercules is with respect to Atlanta. Awesome. Beautiful. Do we have a 4K camera on board? We do. It was on the vehicle for the last expedition. Why did it come off for this one? Oh, that's the thousand dollar question. <laughs> it came off kicking, screaming, and uh, with much resistance. Because the video <laughs> department is, is, we wish we had something better. It, you can't just put a camera on Hercules. Yeah. It's, we are a, uh, because of our telepresence and the way that the video signal has to go through, it doesn't just come up to the control room where we can look at it. It has to uh, be converted to HDSDI and then that has to have a lot of magic happen. Uh, and the, from the video suite, and then the image also then has to be uh, recorded. It has to be uh, go through the data engineering mm -hmm. uh, habitat. So, what's the right word for that? Anyways, that has to that image has to. We have to do something with it, right? We have to yeah. record it, archive it, give it to the client. Um, there's also the the outreach folks who are yeah yeah looking for good images to use in, uh, in, in uh, not only our outreaches, but our, our, you know, what we publish on, on social media. So basically the 4K camera is the only place that it's truly being, that, that it truly appears as 4K is in one of our recorders that we used as, that we use as a burst recorder. So we're never recording it the whole time because it chews up four times as much storage. And so instead of, you know, whatever, one and a half or 1.7 terabytes for a 24-hour dive, you would have, you know, almost 10 terabytes, which is the size of one of our drives. So when we use the 4K camera, as Dan says, we have to down-convert it because although each of the four monitors in front of you are 4K, that's the only way you can see it is 4K, is if we just had one ginormous image. So we have to down convert it to be able to put it into the multi viewers that you can see it in multiple places so that we can, you know, it, yeah, it opens up a whole, and as far as streaming it, that's just a non-issue because we don't have bandwidth. Yeah, so the, basically the workflow of what happens to that image after we see it is complicated. Yeah, but it was great for you. Yeah, it was yeah. awesome for me. I had it... Uh, we we did so we did some testing. The whole point was to test the the proposed workflow because mm. there's several answers there, right? You could not do anything with it, like our tuning cameras, or you could, you know, that's one end of the spectrum. The other end is to record everything in 4K, which is the other, you know, pendulum can yeah yeah hit, hit both rails there. Uh, but so we did some testing with it in uh, different positions on the vehicle, and it was just from a pilot's perspective, replacing the 4x3 composite video with yeah. a wide-angle 4K image, even though it was down-converted for us, uh, was fantastic. Yeah. So, so it wasn't replacing the Zeus cameras, it was replacing some of these, you know, in addition to? Yeah, most vehicles have a an upper and a lower camera. Mm. So... Um, Which helps you give perspective yeah. yeah this vehicle does have an upper and a lower camera it's just an yeah, upper yeah. camera from the turn of the century yeah and, and video technology camera technology has come a long way since then and uh, we are looking at upgrading the the camera that's in that that housing so that housing is probably uh, you know you could have a nice down payment on a house yeah or a really nice used automobile for <laughs> uh, what one of those housings will cost. Yeah. So it's not the 
the camera that's the expensive part is the titanium housing and the custom made um, gorilla glass or you know corny uh, lens optically clear lens and the connector the connector itself is probably more than the camera um, oh yeah by a factor of something yeah the, the connectors are you could put a Raspberry Pi camera in there and have a better image than what we have now, but and stream it as IP up back up to the boat. But that's one of the reasons when we had that thing apart. It was taking all the measurements so we can determine hmm. what kind of uh, possible camera can we can go in there. And then we have the same issue. We have to decide how the workflow is. So that will change from composite to. No, actually, we we thought ahead on that. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, it's pretty. All of this stuff by my left knee just gets bypassed. Yeah. So the top lit, the top row, the jack field, all the conversion, we just move everything down a row and it's all done. Yeah. So the the camera I'm currently looking at is um, the Sony SRG 400 series, and it has um, it'll output um, HDSDI uh, IP video. That's what's in the bubble cam? No, what's in there is a, is a Panasonic. Mm, so it's got 1990 something yeah. or another Panasonic security camera. Mm, perfect. Awesome. Uh, SRG 400s are kind of a conference room quality. They're, they're the little brothers to these uh, Sonys that are here in the, got it. in the control van, which are really... You know, they provide a really nice image. High dynamic range. Yeah. And all the bells and whistles with a modern Sony controller like Dave has in front of him over there. Mm. But the... Or uh, even Jeff. The, uh, or sorry, Jeff. Uh, we're interchangeable. It's okay. <laughs> the, um, the IP aspect also will allow us to uh, control it and see the image in in parallel. Mm. So, for example, while we're doing pre dives we can control the camera from the, from the hangar KVM. Yeah. Or you could have it in an image um, on one of the um, one of the monitors up here. But the, the high def high def image would go through the video. Yeah. Sweet. Okay. But I still don't like it because um, it's you don't get the overall picture, and then when you have to look at the manipulator, you're looking at it backwards. So with the traditional upper and lower pan and tilt, when the manip's in front of the vehicle, you get a dual perspective from both good cameras, which is what we had with the 4K camera. Yeah. To get the 16 by 9, and yeah, I don't know how we survived in the old days. We had, uh, you know, all the cameras on the vehicle were <laughs> like that. And we were looking at them on a um, Sony Trinitron monitor <laughs> and a 19-inch rack CRT monitor, and we that were was the grateful main, for it. <laughs> that was the main monitor, and then the other ones had four little monitors <laughs> in, the, in the space of a 19-inch rack. When, um, when the vehicles are ascending and descending, are the pilots constantly moving the ROVs or is there an automated system controlling them during those times? We are periodically uh, making adjustments on the descent. So Paul's adjusting the, um, the speed of uh, Atalanta's descent to try and maintain 30 meters a minute. And that changes as the layers come off the winch. And then um, Hercules has um, a function that's very similar to cruise control in your car. So I've got that engaged at the moment. And uh, that's uh, providing a constant command to the vertical thrusters. And a little bit of forward just to keep them stretched out. Well, cruise control is going to be an actual control system. This is just like a simple stick lock, right? It just whatever the last command 
that you sent in, it just locks that in and it keeps doing it. Yeah, it's not it's not active. It just locks the current joystick command in. Yeah. That's the electronic version of <laughs> the mechanical yeah. uh, winch control that we have implemented here in the van. But, you know, we're monitoring everything, and that's kind of the important part. Okay. Yeah, it tends to, uh, complacency is one of our uh, enemies up here in the front row, especially during the blue water transits going up and down. There's a lot of dynamics happening, uh, it's a huge amount of uh, energy being expended <coughs> on the winch, and if something goes wrong and we don't catch it right away, um, it could cause us to abort the dive or cause damage to the equipment. So. Mm. Thank you. Okay, Ryan. What kind of animals can we find at this depth? So right now we are at about 1,800 meters, which is similar to some of the dives we've been on the mm -hmm. last few days. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, sort of at the deeper end of the bathial depth range. Um, and so we find a lot of stuff down here, um, really high diversity of corals, primarily soft corals, so octocorals. Um, we've been seeing many different groups of octocorals, chrysogorgids, primnoids, zooanthids, sea pens, mushroom corals, um, lots of sponge diversity as well, which we've been really trying to characterize um, on this mission, taking a bunch of samples of potentially new uh, taxa, um, and, s and also a lot of different arthropods and fish, so crabs, fish, really a wide diversity of things at these depths. And we are going a little bit deeper today, so it'll be interesting to see how the diversity sort of changes as mm -hmm. we go about 1,500 meters deeper to 3,500. Thank you, Ryan. Yeah, of course. Awesome. So we're now at about the depth of a lot of our other dives of almost 2,000 meters, but we've got another 1,500 to go. Oh, yeah. Hitting another record today for this um, NA-138 expedition. I'm finally getting better at saying that. I know. It's taken me a long time to be able to say that. <laughs> I like that though. That whole along. Mm. I feel like it's a phrase more than it's a whole yeah, along. <laughs> for real. <laughs> Too long to be one whole along. Mm -hmm.
Okay. Um, when the tether broke last year, um, and uh, what was what had happened, and then when Hercules finally saw sunlight again, how did you feel about that, Dan? To find for for Herc and Argus to finally return to the surface. I bet it must have felt like a big relief, but I don't. This is a question for you. Yeah, there's a picture floating around that kind of sums it up of uh, Captain Pavel hugging Herc. We were <laughs> pretty happy to get it back. It was uh, an emotional roller coaster of a expedition. Some technical engineering crews and uh, we had some operational issues and some uh, personnel issues and, uh, and when that uh, when we lost the vehicles it was it was a lot to deal with you know it's also our livelihood right without the vehicles uh, we don't work without work we don't get paid I don't uh, I don't have a day job on the beach so this is kind of my gig at the moment gig worker term has become popular in the recent years but <laughs> so uh, there was um, that aspect as well you know the potential of not, not having uh, any any future work so it's a huge relief in a lot of ways to be able to get back to an operational state it was also a challenge to uh, figure out uh, what went wrong and how to uh, how to rectify any issues, possible issues, and what kind of, you know, what we could do to, to make them, to reduce the odds of that happening again. It's always a chance when you put these vehicles over the side, that you won't get them back, and I'm always amazed every single time that we're able to um, put them over the side safely and run them down several kilometers, and they actually work, <laughs> and then and then we can get them back and get them on deck again. Did that happen? Um, where did that happen? At the. What's that? Where did the disconnection happen? In Hawaiian waters? Uh, no, it was um, in Canadian waters. We mm. were in the Endeavour vent field, and we were um, we were following. It was a, <laughs> it was a, I, there's no good time for the to lose the vehicles, but um, we had been monitoring a cable touchdown from a cable uh, a cable lay ship. So we were laying, laying a cable. Uh, from the uh, main endeavor node, one of the satellite cables to uh, to a satellite node. So uh, we had uh, been following this cable touchdown across some very rugged terrain in the Pacific Northwest there and into the Endeavor vent field. So we were coming down a very steep hill and into the field and um, they were lowering, lowering the um, the node which is a big you know I don't know it takes 20 tons or some it's a big big heavy thing that sits on the seabed with a big huge cable attached to it and uh, that was that in itself is is kind of a uh, hydrodynamic, if you will. You know, lowering that thing down, they have to do a layback with the with the lay vessel and make sure they have proper tension on the cable, but not too much. And then trying to get the cable slack down the hill, so we're running back and forth, checking all those parameters and getting close to the seabed with the package. And uh, when we lost the vehicles, there's this cable ship sitting there with this multi-million dollar package dangling 
100 meters off the seabed. <laughs> no, no vehicle to look at it to land it. But they they were able to uh, use the acoustic positioning to safely land it. And uh, I believe all that went okay. We went back and uh, and, uh, they went back with another system and, and verified that everything was okay and didn't come down on any other instruments. And Thank you for sharing. I was just talking um, last night with some of the crew or some of the team members um, about how when someone or something leaves, there's always this possibility of never seeing them ever again. And uh, every time Perk and Ad Atalanta comes back, it's a nice relief, yeah? Yeah. And then we get to sing to all the... The all male the, ola. The male ola and the pohaku that come back that are going to give us all of the enlightenment, all of the researchers, all of the enlightenment that they're asking for. Yes. The studio is just pumping away with the <laughs> class interactions back there. It's a celebration each time. Yeah, it's probably the most rewarding aspect of working on this vessel is uh, what we call the science swarm. When we land mm. uh, Hercules on deck and we open the boxes and all the kids and the uh, all the scientists and their kids get to come out. They call them kids, but they're... You know, 20. Yeah, there's an array of <laughs> array of scientists and often like they'll bring several of the students from their lab. But anyways, the science swarm is uh, a pretty cool moment for us to see the rewards of all the hard work and planning and uh, in a lot of cases years of work that have gone into getting a rock or a sponge or a piece of coral yeah into the uh, into the science lab it's almost like the ROVs being you know during a dive underwater is kind of our happy place it's like what they're meant to be doing but then mm. There's always that relief when they, you know, come up and everything's secured and let's just grab the science and, yeah, just a little bit of weight is off. Yeah, at the end of the day, we're a tool for Ryan to yeah. be able to. Yeah. And it is, it is a tool. We use it as such. It's rewarding to see the, the payoff. And that's always a, you know, interesting line to walk of we want to get as much science done as we can, but then we also need to, you know, make sure that we're keeping the vehicles healthy so we can keep doing dives in the future. Mm -hmm. so there's always that, that kind of tug between how hard we push for the current dive and um, making sure that we're going to leave everything in good shape for future dives. Definitely. Yeah, we um, we enjoy watching. It's like the scientists are kids that get to enter their favorite candy store <laughs> each time. Yeah. It really is always so exciting to pull things <laughs> off the basket. And never gets old. Definitely. No, it never does get old. It's always different too. Do you guys um, remember um, who created the tiki that lives on Hercules? Yeah, no, one of the um, one of the bosons that we had was very good at carving. I can't remember his name. Mark knows his name. Yeah, I didn't know him, but I think Dwight mentioned that he carved it during the dive or after the dive on the Titanic, uh, which is a kind of cool piece of history.
it's really the tiki that I didn't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when we got our um, when we got our uh, our tour of the of Hercules, that was a little part of it, and I thought that was super cool. And generally, it's um, the newest Argus pilot will. Uh, kind of be responsible for oiling the tiki. That said, I mean, if it hasn't been oiled before a dive, anyone should do it. Um, mm. But yes, we oil it before every dive. I see. Oh yeah, I checked them 15 minutes ago. Uh, all good? Yeah. I thought it was time to finally do them properly and write it down. Hmm. Do you guys know of um, any team members that have um, been able to sit in every single position in the van? Yeah, I've, I've sat in all the chairs up here. I haven't I've sat in uh, any of the chairs in the back row. I was going to say, yeah. I've sat in the chairs. I haven't actually done anything. <laughs> uh, I mean, I've sat in the chairs before. They're all the same, so. Totally. I like to go, go and adjust them all so everybody's just saying, wait a minute, this isn't how I had it adjusted. No, this chair is kind of silly. It's, it's nice that it doesn't rotate. I appreciate that yeah. sometimes. Um, in general, it I think... It should be a Recaro leather chair. But with heating <laughs> and air conditioning, then that would be... You want the, <laughs> yeah, I think the we'd always have the heater on in this case. Yeah. A lot of systems, uh, we have the Recaro Italian leather with the heating, air conditioning, and back <laughs> massage built in. Usually that's the AC that's running <laughs> in the chair. It has like mm. a built-in AC back your car. In general, I think a lot of the people that have been doing, you know, Nautilus for more than five or eight years have have kind of at least done a variety of roles and help out in the deck operations or you know pitch in where needed um and so end up getting a little bit of that experience but you know most people like when we're on watch we we all have specialized into knowing our particular roles well so it's uh that's generally what we stick to pigs village though yeah It definitely does take a village. And, and in the front row, there's so many monitors, and we're relatively close to each other. We're always cross-checking each other. You know, it's like, hey, your iris is a little, oh, yeah, sorry, thanks. Or is the ship moving? Ah, is so we're constantly kind of looking. And mm. And, and if you sit in any of the chairs long enough, you kind of know I at least the tempo of the dive, if not the, the specifics. Mm. You know, when we see, like from a video standpoint, when we see them start to put the daisy chain on, that's typically about a 15 minute warning. Yeah, not always, but you know, okay, if, if they start putting the daisy chain on, I need to come in here and start going through my checks to make sure that everything's okay. Mm -hmm. And then within my checks, when the ROV pilots come in and they do, you know, their pre uh, high voltage checks, you know, and you kind of get the rhythm of, of what they're checking and, okay, well, do I need to do some stuff or am I, you know, 
I always want to be waiting on them. I never want to be in a situation where they're waiting on me. Mm, mm -hmm. So as soon as I fire the cameras up, you'll see that I zoom them in and out really quick. I check the irises really quick. I make sure that I can focus them really quick. I don't want them to have to turn them on and ask if I've done that. I don't mm. want them waiting on me. So, but you do, you know, okay, who's on the radio? Who's, where are they at? Oh, they've, you know, they've got the high voltage John, You'll hear them say, you know, high voltage in five, and then the cameras come on and yada, yada, yada. So, um, and yeah, there's every now and then Paul will reach over and, you know, <laughs> zoom it, you know, add Atlanta's camera in because it's right, the control's right next to him. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, Dan will leave the porch lights on and I'll notice it and say, hey, you know, partially because my picture starts to look crummy, but, mm -hmm. you know, hey, turn your porch lights off or turn your porch lights on. So, yeah, and there's a lot of that interplay, right? So, I mean, obviously, the every one of those shots that we zoom in on, kind of the the pilot and the video have to be on the same page and kind of predicting what each other are going to do. There's other situations, like um, for sampling, whoever's on the arm is probably almost 100% focused on the manipulator, so the other pilot will be getting the boxes ready and swapping camera views to make those easier. Um, and then while the two pilots are doing that, the nav will be paying extra close attention to the position of the vehicles, checking the sonar, things like that. Um, paying attention to like ship moves, if it's a long sample or something goes wrong with the manipulation, then um, kind of being ready for where the vehicle is going to get dragged to or you know, is everything Watch in a good place? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. If, if we're sampling something and, you know, pushing a box out or s trying to position the vehicle so that we can slurp something and one guy's on the arm, the other guy's driving Hercules or whatever, I, I, I can see the, the Argus GUI or the Atlantic GUI, and I know which number's the delta number, the delta depth number between the two vehicles. And I know where, well, with Dan, that can be single digits and no one worries. But for other people, it's like, if that gets into single digits and they're both concentrating really hard and they get distracted by something, you know, same thing with the navigator. We're both kind of, or the navigator's looking at the sonar going, um, hey, guys, yeah, there's stuff within the 10-meter ring on Argus. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and, and it's subtle. We may not say anything. We may not, we probably won't say anything on SPL. But just put a bug in the air to say, Hey, you know, and they'll glance up and do something, and everything's okay. Mm -hmm. Making sure there's communication there yeah. and notifying everything on what's happening, if there anything hap if anything happens. We have a code word for that. It's usually pull up. Yeah. <laughs> pull up. <laughs> pull up. <laughs> Followed by a firm <laughs> now. Now. <laughs> Just like that. I don't know if you ever watch any of the movies where the planes, you know, slowly headed for the mountain. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. The computer is saying, pull, pull up. up. Pull <laughs> up. Oh, it's really fun when you're actually flying and, and a controller comes on and says, you know, fly heading 090, <laughs> expedite. And you're going, oh, okay, that means he wants me to get out of the way of somebody. <laughs> so I got a funny story. Expedite. <laughs> um, this wasn't my watch and this was years ago, but there was a... Uh, like a seasoned Herc pilot and a brand new Argus pilot, and they, uh, the Argus pilot was its it was his first time in in the chair getting to fly, and the Herc pilot said, you know, all right, if this is you know what you do, if anything goes wrong or you want to change back, just let me know, you know, you got this, and so the Argus pilot is sitting there flying Herc, and all of a sudden, they're coming up on a, a cliff, one of those pull up, pull up now. <laughs> <laughs> and the Argus pilot just looks back, I want to change back, and there's no time. You've got to just go full stick up. <laughs> Let me out of here. <laughs> we had a similar situation on a, one of the commercial vehicles I work on. We were doing um, a pre -lay, what we call prelay survey. So we're doing a survey where they're going to lay a oil and gas pipeline, which gets really boring. You're looking at mud for mm. days and days and days at a time. And um, we come on shift one day, and the, the current shift is troubleshooting one of the cameras on the, to their management system, which is their version of Argus, right? Mm -hmm. 
and um, they can't figure out why the camera's not working. They're turning it on and off, and they're checking the ground faults, and they're checking the video router. And um, On the GUI, there's these two depth lines like we have on Grafana for the mm -hmm. depth of each one. And um, when it, we had a trainee on board, as we often do, and uh, so there's six of us in the control van, and the trainee says, uh, isn't the little blue line supposed to be above the little yellow line? <laughs> <laughs> What had happened, there was a gradual uphill. It's generally like pretty flat, you know? Yeah. So there was a gradual uphill, and the operators didn't notice, so the, the TMS was dragging in the mud. <laughs> <laughs> it had covered the camera with mud. They couldn't see anything. Oh. That was a classic pull up moment. <laughs> yeah, sometimes being an ROV pilot is uh, flying through the water or taking samples, and sometimes it's cleaning mud or blubber off of uh, off of vehicles. <laughs> All the glory. All the glory. All the glory. My favorite part is probing for high voltage with hydraulic oil dripping off your elbows, <laughs> running down into your armpits. <laughs> Is hydraulic oil conductive? No. No. I didn't think so. Unless it has water in it. Yeah, it has water <laughs> in it. And it can be quite conductive. I got a reputation my first year as just being known for the guy who liked washing the vehicles off. Um, and I was really in a phase of my PhD where just there were a lot of like open-ended questions that I was worried about and not just how do I do something, but what projects should I even be doing in what direction should I be taking them? And uh, that kind of corresponded with my first internship out here. And um, there was something just so pleasantly peaceful about someone telling me, giving me a hose and just saying, go wash this vehicle. And I could just stand there for like 10 minutes and life was just simple. Just replace salt water with fresh water. I've had moments like that on this cruise where I'm like, oh, just give me something meaningless to do, please. <laughs> Watering your ROVs is very satisfying. Watering your garden at your lawn on a yeah. bright spring There's whole summer morning yeah. or summer afternoon. In case maybe. People post online just pictures of pressure washing. And I mean, not that we're necessarily <laughs> pressure washing the vehicles, but there is something so satisfying about that like spray of water slowly cleaning everything off. Agreed. SPL stands for Science Party Line. And SPL is what our viewers listen to. And depending on the situation, um, those of us in the van can turn it on, turn it off. And the party line part of it is not that we're partying all the time. So <laughs> no. It's actually a function of the software that controls the intercom and how we create this in software. And it's actually referred to as a PL, as a party line. So mm. stop science in front of that and you get SPL. Thank you, Jeff. One of my favorite Instagram accounts that I follow is actually just a like rock climbing gym, and they just post videos of them pressure washing the chalk off their holds. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I love that. There's a whole pressure washing video game out there. Oh really? my gosh. <laughs> We need some more uh, outreach photos of uh, <laughs> Argus pilots watering their vehicles. <laughs> if that 14-year-old who asked about video games last night is still listening, it turns out that uh, the pressure washing vehicle or uh, simulator game is is good preparation. <laughs> Do not encourage them, Paul. <laughs> some time vacuum. Yeah, Paul. <laughs> I know this. I have also teenagers at home. Awesome. 
So the Argus pilot will eventually become the Hercules pilot? Or is it just for the internship? No, um, it really depends. So uh, that's kind of the pathway, but it takes a long time and a lot of training and a lot of hours. Uh, so generally after kind of the first internship, um, you know, if, if you like it and it all goes well, then you can come back as, you know, an Argus pilot as a contractor. Um, but it kind of takes years of doing that and shadowing the Herc pilots and getting more and more of the maintenance experience and operations experience um, before kind of being ready for that responsibility. Um, you know, for myself, like, I can fly the vehicle and I can take samples, but if certain weird things go wrong, I definitely still need uh, the experience of someone to tell me like what's going wrong or what to do next. So kind of until you've lived through enough of those situations that you just know what to do in, in every possible uh, error that could occur, um, that's kind of when you're ready. You just have to have a lot of experience, all of it bad. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thank you. A whale shark yesterday. That was a really nice treat. And uh, the noise that we may have heard in the video was a uh, noise that was coming from the boat, not the ROVs. Yeah, good observation. Thank you. What you looking at over there, Diane? We're both enjoying some sponges. Yeah. This beautiful check. morning. Yeah, it's lovely. <laughs> you know, I've got so much to learn back here in the data log chair uh, that it doesn't help. I mean, it does help for me to like kind of go through some of our guides and just kind of brush up on like where to find the things even. Um, so that I can help with some IDs and feed our scientists ashore the accurate information so that they can help ID. So, yeah, I love these. I love these guides. I feel like I'm getting getting a little bit of like handle on just the, the tip of the sponge. Mm. Yeah. Well. Mm. Can you say that instead of tip of the iceberg? Tip of the tip sponge. Tip of the sponge. Tip sure. of the sponge. Tip of the coral. Tip the car. Just like a real iceberg, though. There's a lot below the There's surface. There's a lot <laughs> below the surface, exactly. So much. So, yeah. I'm still probably above the water as well. No. No, no. If you're above the water line, then I don't know. I'm in orbit around space. <laughs> but I think sponges are fascinating. They are. Just the different morphological variety in them is so crazy. Yeah, it's astounding. All with the same sort of body plan too. They're just, they're pumping water through them. Yeah. But they've really evolved to do it in so many uh, different ways and take advantage of different flow regimes and whatnot. We're about 700 meters away from our target depth. Yep, about 22 minutes. So fun. Awesome. No plane with the tumble straighter. <laughs> Sorry, Jeff, I've wanted to do that for so long and I don't get to sit in this chair next to the telestrator. It's so exciting. Is it good Go reason ahead, why the use the telestrator. Not next to me. Because I want to do this. <laughs> what else you got, Diane? Oh, man. What else do I got? <laughs> well.
Great. No. Well, she could still practice the telestrator, right? I was practicing. Yeah, yeah, just use the lines. Use right. words. Where's our line? Where's the line one? Just the ah. yellow one. arrow or just there the pencil. Go. Okay, and so if I were actually trying to circle a sponge or go. something, this is how I would do it. You can also like point to a place to go. Wow, oh, that's, oh, that's Which nifty. is pretty useful. Yeah, like, hey, not this rock, but that one back there. Right. Ah, nice. okay. And so for context for anyone, um, the Telestrator images don't actually go out uh, on the web feed, but... Yeah, they do. They do? Yeah. Oh. I take that all back. I didn't know that. Well, it depends if I have, if I have it punched up, but I think I do. Mm -hmm. Draw drawn it again. Just put a mark on it. I mean... About this know. bottom mark. Yeah, oh, that's so. nifty. Oh, yeah. So we use those... Um, to highlight, you know, the pilots <laughs> don't know all the scientific names and don't necessarily know what the scientists um, want to see if there's a whole pile of sponges or corals or something. So uh, it's really handy for the back row to be able to tell us what they want. Uh, we used to just have a long poking stick. We, we so. still have it somewhere. <laughs> Where is it? Is it over in front of the navigator? So that was the low-tech solution. Yeah, it was a hockey stick that we would point at the screen with. I guess you get your workout that way too, you know, wielding a hockey stick around. Maybe it's not. Don't encourage the navigator with the pokey stick. <laughs> no encouraging. No, but the Telestrator is a uh, very handy tool. I've noticed that on our watch, Beth will often be like, hey, this little rock right yeah. here. Yeah. There um, was, it was an interesting discussion that somebody was like, Oh, what if we put a telestrator in the new system and at first you're going because they're not inexpensive this is the same box that they use on you know monday night football and the you know super bowl and everything it's the same telestrator wow and so and that thing is loaded with you know football uh, icons and baseball icons and you, you know it's, it's the whole deal and there's a lot of discussion and then and then it was well, how easy is it to use? Well, it's relatively easy. We teach announcers how to use it, so it's not that hard. And uh, so we installed it. We put it in and wired it all up and everything. And it was like, man, it takes somebody just like you five seconds to figure this out and off to the races. Yeah. It's and it, it really is very useful you know, mm -hmm. from a video standpoint, too. It's like, okay, what rock are they talking about? Where am I trying to focus? Oh, okay, that one. Definitely. The rock amongst all the rocks. Yes. Can you pick up that rock? Which rock out of the field of a hundred did you want me to pick up? Yeah, I extremely user-friendly and very direct because, yeah. like, you can very accurately and quickly, you know, indicate to the pilots where you're, where you're, what you're seeing and what you're interested in sampling or looking at, or and to the video people, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, how long has underwater exploration been around for? Since the beginning of humans, maybe? Like, I think we've always been fascinated by what's under the surface. Sure Even if that, that means you can only dive, you know, Somebody, th down. somebody grabbed a, you know, when somebody discovered glass and then had to blow glass into something semicircular and then discovered that if you turn it upside down, it captures the air and said, I'm going to put this over my head and jump in the water. And who knows when that was? Well, the first trip to the Marianas Trench was in the 60s, 50s. Yeah. But uh, for modern exploration, uh, the Alvin Sphere was made in 1964. What was what was the Trieste, wasn't it? What's that? What was the vessel that went the, the Trieste? Trieste. Yeah.
There was the original Bathysphere too in the in the thirties oh, that went down. Yeah. Um. We used to have a bunch of um, underwater laps, didn't we? Now they're still do. Still do. How many yeah, are left? Anchored out at Scripps. The uh, what is the name of that thing? It turns it turns over. Oh no no no! Uh, the the flip. Yeah. But there was some kind of like an ISS, but at the bottom of yeah, the yeah, there was Sea Lab. Yeah, in the C -Lab. the Caribbean, wasn't it? One might still be in Florida, maybe, because there was an astronaut, who was it, Scott Carpenter, who also went to space and spent time down in Sea Lab. But ROV tech has come a long way in the last, uh, I don't know, since the 70s and had 300 meter systems. Which, uh, so they had ROVs that could go to the same depth as a saturation diver. And uh, you know, now we're running it down to 3,000 meters, so it's significant uh, improvement, kind of similar to um, some of the analogies that are the automobile industry and the, um, and the airline industry. Was it not long ago the Wright Brothers were? It's a very interesting uh, tech on the horizon too. I think, the, I think what Katachi's doing and Paul's field in the robotics is just making huge leaps and bounds. Makes me wonder where this, uh, what kind of tech will, you know, in the next decade or two. I think you're going to see, um, similar to the drone industry, where it went from a complicated home-built monstrosity with wires and different components everywhere to uh, something the size of a size of a mouse with everything on one board that can hold position and zoom around for half an hour. Okay. I wonder if we can do this. I'll just say it out loud. Um, since we see where everyone is sitting right now, can we know who sits where and what most screens indicate? Is that is that a thing? I feel like the front row from Paul to Kotachi. Yeah, so I'm Paul raising my hand. Hi. Um, I'm one of the uh, pilots. I'll play along here, hang on. Oh yeah. So now we're up on the... I need to hang my hat on that camera. Oh. There we go. There's the front row. So I'm in the blue jacket. Dan in the middle. Katachi off to the right. Camera's, camera has a hard time seeing down that position because it's tilting down all the way. There's Katachi. Hey. I'll go back right. over into the back row. Hi, I'm Malanai. I am the Science Communication Fellow, and I'm looking at these screens here. I'm Ryan, scientist. Got the Telestrator here, and scientists ashore uh, talking to me on this other computer. Fiona. And that's the one position in this van that you can't get with that camera, so How I have to switch it? to that one. Wait, where's the camera? Where's okay, it's in this corner now. Behind you. And, oh, uh, that one over there? Let me grab control yep. oh, that this one over there. That one there. Hi, everybody. I'm Fiona. I'm the data logger, and I basically have the data log set up where I kind of just list whatever goes on in the dives, and then I also have the scientists, the short chat, open up for that as well. And so there you can see all the different monitors, the chat, the one of the GUIs, one of the ROV GUIs, uh, the Telestrator, and Ryan there. Uh, some, there's two computers dedicated to the scientists so they can pull up a couple, you know, they can each independently work on their own computers. Uh, let's 
switch to that camera and grab remote control of that guy. And then if you go to the front row, kind of, you can get an idea. There's the Hurt GUI in front of Dan. Uh, to the right is what we call ROV NAV or ROV NAV. It's showing position of the two ROVs relative to the ship. Um, Katachi has high pack up on one of them, and then the screen above him on that is the dynamic positioning system. Go above over. that, we even have two yeah, sonars. Yeah, there's the two sonars. There is um, uh, the engineer computer, computer yeah. and uh, uh, Adelina's GUI, and then you can see uh, that Paul has Rob Nav over there. If we pull back, I think I can get most of the wall. Um, the upper left is Atlanta, the upper right is Herc, and then all the various mon or, uh, um, cameras that Dan was talking about earlier. There's winch cameras over on the left, so they keep an eye on the winch. There's the ROV auxiliary cameras. Argus is to the left, Herc's is to the right. Um, some other, when you hear them refer to the high voltage, we can keep an eye on the high voltage camera, we can keep an eye on the winch gauges. And that's about it. Thank you so much, Jeff. Where are we at? 32. No, we actually have telemetry now to the uh, high voltage cabinet. I'm also looking at that data on the Grafana page here in front of me. That's, oh, a, that's, recent, an uh, that's a recent upgrade. Yeah, I didn't know about that. Yeah, we uh, Robert put a data acquisition module and installed the high voltage cabinet and wired it up and then the uh, data engineers were able to take that data and scale it and uh, put it on our Grafana page here. That's the uh, engineer computer so it's um, sonar, it's our focal diagnostic so we'd get to know how much uh, like whether or not we're actually receiving communications from the vehicle and then the winch tension readouts so we know like what the winch tension is right now and we have like the history of it and it records also the peak value which is also displayed in at least three places too. yeah we have uh there's a lot of redundant uh, information displayed up here not a lot but some of it is uh, we're slowly consolidating that into the uh, Grafana display, so all that's going into a, an influx database that's getting recorded at uh, some of them at a fairly high frequency, like the, the winch tension is at 20 hertz. That enables us to uh, go back and look at the historical data in detail if there's uh, technical issues that we're trying to troubleshoot or just to have the history for a trend of something that's uh, where the parameters are getting uncomfortable for us. So we can go back and look, see what's happening and why. And you, you know, a lot of that data might be redundant. Like right here, I can see the winch tension in three different places, but one of those is on the control panel where it's most useful, like when I'm actually, um, you know, controlling the, the winch. Another one is kind of in the Grafana display that shows, that's like my very quick, how's everything gauge. And then we've got a dedicated witch tension readout graph that if we want to like sit there and look at the time series, you know, that's the best place for it. So um, in a sense it's redundant, but also like we really do get trained for where to quickly look for each piece of data when we're doing a particular task as well. There's, yeah, there's definitely a lot going on. Um, some people have their own computers in front of them, and then we'll have other screens that are um, showing us what other people are looking at. So like in the back row, um, each person can control their own computer. However, um, there will be an, an additional screen showing what the ROV pilots might be looking at or showing us a close-up view of Herc or Atalanta and um, 
I feel like a lot of people look at my screen a lot because my screen is showing the comments usually. So I remember last night there was my screen. What's that? Um, typically that's not a front row thing. We have a lot going on up here and um, as I mentioned we are watching the trends and um, periodically scanning what's happening so it, it, it's not our job to Awesome. Thanks. And then the little air bubbles that we see flowing up, are it's actually um, marine snow. And marine snow is, I'll have Ryan explain a little bit about what marine snow is. Yeah, so there's um, a bunch of different components of marine snow. Um, there's fecal pellets from copepods and other plankton uh, that sort of coalesce until they get heavy enough to sink. There's uh, mucus, there's actual planktonic organisms themselves, things like jellies. Um, yeah, it's basically just the dense rain of organic matter that lives at the surface and eventually comes down. Mm -hmm. And then this is all the food that all the corals and sponges we see, this is all the food they will eat. Nom nom nom. Lovely. Someone's uh, someone's asking what was the new black cable that was connected to Herc yesterday. Maybe it wasn't new. Maybe it's I don't know. It's just a cable that gets connected. Yeah, not a new cable. Yeah, thank you. What was the most interesting um, hmm. What was the most interesting um, discovery that you have been a part of? Um, I was part of the team that discovered a really large deep sea coral reef complex off the east coast mm. uh, that was about the size of Delaware in linear length, so a huge, huge coral reef um, that was mapped and imaged in, in 2018. Awesome. Fiona, mm -hmm. what is a, um, at your work? in yeah. Saipan, what does like a regular day of work look like for you? Or like some of the usual? Um, it really depends on the time of the year. Maybe I'll give you the most interesting bit. S starting from spring throughout the summer, this is when we do a lot of our coral reef marine monitoring. And we're usually out like twice a week on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Um, and we get to travel to different islands and check out the reefs down there. Um, I really enjoy going down to the island of Rhoda because they have like a really beautiful and pristine reef. Like it's the kind where you like really see it in the movies where the water is so clear and you can like see all the way to the bottom and you can see all the big fish swimming around and it's just really, really colorful. 
Um, and then on Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays, those are like office days. And we just uh, input all the data that we collected from out on the field. And uh, yeah, that's it basically. And then with core restoration, we're also out on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So we're either out um, marking spots for coral collection um, or out at the nursery doing maintenance and measurements. And then the same thing Monday, Wednesday, Friday, back in the office, logging everything onto an Excel sheet. That's it. So uh, just for everyone in the back row, we're getting pretty close to the ground here. Um, so we're going to get focused in the front. Um, we have altitude. Yeah. How many more minutes? What's that? Short. Like we're uh, within. Three, two minutes. Yeah. Kirk's about uh, Should I 60 go? meters off the Should I? No. Should I go and grab Dwight? He's, he 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 uh, he can probably yeah, see I'm from. Sure, he's uh, keeping an eye in from the, the lounge. Yeah. In the lounge. Okay. Cool. He's got the uh, the sonar display up there. Is. Mmm. Cool. Where's our uh, first waypoint, Katachi? Where? North. Of yeah. Way. North. Yep. You just confirm. No, actually, uh, northeast. Roger. That's the uh, what we're seeing uphill there in the Argus on If you slow down a bit there, Paul, I'll come underneath you. in your auto heading there if you want. Maybe come uh, to a zero four five. Did you say four five? Uh, zero four five, yeah. Yeah. It's uh, gonna be uphill. Come on, stop for a minute. Okay. I'll stop. Hello. I don't have the contours for this dive. Mm. Yeah, we can uh, see in uh, Atalanta's sonar. I'm getting a pretty good return while it's still. Gonna switch you over to DVL. Uh, yeah, if you want. Oh, and there's the bottom. Hi. High ocean floor. Okay, and are we generally go down ahead. another uh, 20 meters probably? 20? Yeah. Copy that. Mm. Uh, is this dive generally going back uphill up this up the seamount? Yep. Okay. We've uh, seemed to have calm waters, but we definitely are hitting the 10,000 mark on the tension pretty regularly now. Mm. Hey guys, welcome back. Hey there. Sorry, I missed all the fun. <laughs> Any? Uh, how did it go with the satellite? Yeah. Uh, we sort of have a plan. We think that there's some changes that they made that haven't quite taken effect yet. And um, 
We're going to make some adjustments to the streams to try to increase the okay. quality of stream Almost one. There on the winch. But um, that hasn't quite taken effect yeah, yet either, get, so uh, we'll you see. Want. At least we have plans and everyone's on the same page for how to uh, compensate for the lack of bandwidth that we're experiencing right now. for white balance. All right. Is that a good spot for you? Or do you want them a little bit lower? No, you're all right. You're out in the light, so just bump it down a little bit. There you go. Between the two of us, we'll try and center it up. Long wipe is better. I can bring it in a little bit more. There you go. That's good. Pretty deep. 3,524. You guys ready? I'm going to blind you. Roger. <laughs> All right, going black. We've already basically blinded him with the uh, <laughs> yeah, position I know, of the he can't arm. really fly with an arm set in front of him. So. That's all right. I have instruments and, and other I left uh, bubble cam. All right, and going white. Yeah, I like that. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks. You guys getting all set in the front row? Yeah, I did. We're there. A lot of cable out. Yeah. Yeah. So, I think since this is our deepest point, the first order of business might be to grab a rock for Val. I do that. Okay, we do have two on the, uh, or two and a half on the main comp. Yeah, that's. That's still 50%. Looks like we're on a pretty good slope here. It's uh, sloping down beneath us. Yeah. Lots of sediment and dislodged rocks. Then sort of this hard crust. So these are a little crusty looking to me. It's an interesting uh, yeah. break open right here. Yeah, take a zoom on that if you can. It looks up. Uh, yeah. It's got a face on it. <laughs> I like breaking them off of there. Looks like it sort of crumbled apart there. Coming down just a little bit. Turn porch lights on. Right. Porch light. Yeah, you can Very thick crust, I think. Looks like there's a leaf over there. Oh, we can take a look around this area before we do a ship move. I don't see anything great to sample here yet. This seamount has never been seen before, right? This is the first time we anyone's ever done. 
Correct. Yep. And uh, I don't think we've said the name yet, but we are on Nootka Seamount today, just below 3,500 meters right now. Mm -hmm. A part of the Liliokalani Seamount Ridge. And we are in the Papahanaumokuake Marine National Monument. Um, and the purpose of this, or the main goal for this dive, is to collect rocks to help with um, dating the seamount, yes? Right. And rocks to characterize some of the microbial diversity and productivity on some of these ferromanganese encrusted rocks. Ferromanganese. And then also to characterize the biodiversity mm -hmm. of this seamount and the broader biogeographical region. That's a very little interesting rock formation right there, that very yeah. pillowy. Uh, yeah, I think that's more structure indicative of thick ferromanganese crust formation. Mm. Break it off of the vehicle. They're almost like nodules mm. that don't grow in the sediment, that, that grow on the rock, you know? Mm. So there's probably a little impurity on the rock surface that, um, or some little protrusion on the rock surface that the crusts congregate on and grow around, and it almost makes it look like a nodule on top of the rock, or attached to the rock. Oh, you missed it. Trying to do a port sample with the vehicle there. Well, is there a crack there? One could probably. Yeah, I don't think we want to collect any of these right here. Roger. We'll keep looking. Oh, these could be good samples for our USGS colleagues. I'll ask. like a actinostolid anemone there. The actinostolid anemone. Macrobiology we're seeing and a sea star a little bit over to the right. Is it expected that the O2 level is high here? Yeah, so the oxygen minimum zone in this region sits around 900 to 1200 meters and as you sort of move shallower or deeper than that, oxygen is a little bit higher. So. I think it's sort of as expected. Another sea star. Yeah. Were you able to identify what if those sea stars a, are the same or? We need a big rock for ballast. Yeah, right. Lounge to control van. Huh. Go ahead, lounge. Yes. Hi. Yes. Uh, looks like uh, Beth may be interested in a rock here. Uh, all right. So it sounds like Beth may be interested in a rock here. Yes. You haven't, you haven't entered a ship move in yet, have you? Nope. No. no. Okay. But we are light, Talk so about. we could use a, a big okay. rock. <laughs> we didn't bring as much ballast as we normally do, so fill your boots. But we also can't drop any ballast, or can't drop as much. Uh, well, if you want to try to poke at some of these larger ones and see if they can be collectible. Yeah. Is that a bamboo coral? Yeah, These are still pretty big, I think. On the first bamboo coral. Ah. Is that a rock of opportunity you were circling there? I, I think so. It looked a little large, but uh, that could work well. Zoom in there, Jeff. Right coming on. Mm -hmm. That is, uh, might not be a bamboo coral, actually. Probably a sea pen, because it's growing in sediment. Oh, uh, yeah. Pretty large-sized brill star there. Maybe a helipterid sea whip. Not positive on that ID. No 
Nope. Sorry, Dan. Touch the one right there with the scene and you know. This one? Okay. Move it up. Pretty well attached, huh? Keep yeah. your uh, keep your weapon handy there. Yep. And I know we've got uncooked uh, potato for Val. Is there a shape or type for Beth? One with lots um, of microbes on it. Yeah, probably very crusty looking. Maybe some of Thick. these up on the right. Too big? We'll hopefully get them to weigh in. So uh, that's pretty big, microbes. but see what the one on the right. Yeah, that looks good. Sorry, I was muted again. Oh, wait for it to clear up, Paul. Okay, any of these for that? Okay. Now I can see it. Maybe uh, can see it let's check. It. She's in the chat. I'm gonna pick this up just to get a close look at it. Get it out of the dust here. Yeah, I think she was saying she liked that one. Try to let the sediment settle for a second to get a look at the texture of the rock. I can bring it in even a little closer too. Yeah, right there in the light. We're going to get zoom on. That looks pretty good. For Beth, yeah. Uh, Double check. I think that would be good for oh, either I think of us. She's, yes, she likes it. Thank you. Cool. Uh, so this will go in the forward bio uh -huh. box. Right. Look at all those rocks moving. Oh, yeah. See that one on the right is loose. Uh, does it matter which one we go in? No, it doesn't matter. What sample number are we up to? 134. Thank you. Lambda. Uh, Tooltory is really slow. All right, ready for the first ship move? I think we're getting a rough for battle as well. Is oh, okay. There? Uh, we might, yeah, we'll keep our eyes peeled, but we uh, I think we want a Niskin here. Mm -hmm. Oh, right. right. Sorry, I forgot about the Niskin. So, so we take the Niskins whenever we take uh, one of Beth's rocks? Correct. Yeah. Got it. Uh, hold off on the Niskin real quick. Just yeah, one I'll second. Wait. I'll wait for it to clear out here. You can get ready, though. Okay, go ahead. And give that a few more seconds. There. It's a pretty good current, so. Uh, the uh, red one is number one. Yeah. Hold on a sec. No, I still get yeah. wafting by the. Oh, hang, hang on a sec. The uh, we're supposed to be off the bottom a little bit. No. Off the bottom. Yeah. Right. And let try to not. We're, we're trying not to get a clean water sample, not one with sediment yeah, floating, yeah. wafting around. Okay. Is that good? Yeah, I think so. Who's happy with that? Yeah. Three, two, one. 
biscuit. Got it. All right, biscuit number one. All right, nice, nice job. Yeah, I think ship moves might take a while, or uh, yeah, Argus moves might take a while, so might as well try to get a move underway. Might as well. And it'll take a few minutes to even yeah. feel it down here, so. Sounds good. Head towards the first wave, or the second waypoint. Yep. Bridge, this is Nav. Can we go 40 meters uh, bearing 060, please? Hey, Dan, are you good without the screen for a couple minutes? Sure. Right. <laughs> you got the port, port <laughs> lights on? No. They're not on? They are not on. Okay. If you keep trying, you might get the front flip. Stone, as it's called. <laughs> That's where the term came from. How many stones you have in the hold. Is everything we're looking at here crust? I think so. Looks like it to me. It's hard to tell. Roger. Mid-watch stretch right when we get to the surface. This certainly looks all like all crust, like a crust pavement. Mm. But it, would this be the solid manganese crust or there's still Swim in there? rock underneath it? Like in yeah, it has to grow on something, so, but it could have uh, broken off or, um, hard to, hard to tell. It's like a branched bamboo there. Come on, camera, behave. Okay, zoom in a bit more. It is interesting how it's got a certain thickness to it and uh, that lumpy texture. What's this? Very yeah, dark. Yeah, what was that dark patch? Yeah. It's kind of interesting. Yeah, can we go take a look at, at this uh, dark feature in the rock? What dark feature? Yeah. Just up from the lasers now. A sea star. It's so tiny, so cute. Looks like a crack in the, oh in yeah. the crust. It was the way the light was hitting it. It's a, you know, yeah, like a just bubble really that's bust. So man, if you want to. And there's a bunch of them if you if we look right. <laughs> okay, I should be able to yeah, just it, there. it's not a uh, sediment covered like or, or has growth on it. Can we peek down at the yeah. star just below this too? Yeah, that's good on the rock, thanks. 
Okay. Is it a or a Biscuit Star? Biscuit Star. Find the camera, not the ROV. Yeah, find the ROV. And what are those little stalks sticking out of the That's sediment cool, just up in the left um, from the Sea Star? Yeah, I'm not sure. The old corals, tube worms. Could be a tube worm, it could be a. Hmm, not positive. Oh, there's a lot of them all over the place. They're yeah. Hard to see, but Is there much current here? No. No? Uh, but the, well, yeah, there was a fair bit coming down the hill. I mean, the, the, uh... Atalanta is using almost no thrusters. When I uh, stirred up the dust there, it came towards us quite oh, yeah. rapidly. And it cleared up. Well, I don't think I really have too much to look at. Uh, as far as the rocks go, so I think the focus for now should be seeing what animals are here, and uh, if we happen to again, yeah. if we happen to see a cool cool rock along that along the way, we'll take a look at it. That falls in, is it? Thank you. Just a touch past the jewelry if you want. Keep moving towards the waypoint. Yeah. Uh, Birch, this is enough. Another 20 meters at bearing 060, please. Uh, two zero meters at zero six zero, please. We can uh, probably try forty for the next one, it's unless uh, we're still on the lookout for a rock, are we? Roger. to pick up another rock, right? Yeah, we're trying, to we're trying to find something that's not so crusty looking. So I, I think the focus can be on looking at animals for the moment while we um, right. wait for the ship to move a little bit. Bring your head to the left for us. Oh. Yeah. Atalanta's definitely moving. like the same.
Not seeing much movement in the water, are you? No. Very little or almost no marine snow. There's a crinoid over here I think we could take a look at. Do you need me to track him down? Roger. <coughs> Boy, not a whole lot of... Uh Animal life here, no, is there? No, not yet. Yeah, really bumpy crust. Another C pen. Is that a little cup coral, or is that a sea anemone? That is an anemone. Looks like a skeleton of a sponge there, is it perhaps? Yeah, or? maybe a coral stalk. So maybe indicative of something going up a little, something going on a little higher up the slope. And then another two sea pens there. Yep. They cast a nice shadow. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. You haven't gotten to talk about what you do on the daily for work mm. or on a regular. Mm -hmm. I'd like to hear it. Okay. Uh. Cricket. <laughs> Before I get into that, there's a... Um, Who's, um, interested in wondering how what we do with the rocks. So before that, what are we looking at right now? A bit more. Hard to say, maybe a bamboo coral. Yeah. Looks like bamboo coral. Yeah, we're not sure. We just really got to the bottom here, and we're taking the first look around. Uh, at first glance, it looks like a very uh, thick manganese pavement, almost. Um, so these are ferromanganese crusts that grow on top of the these rock. These are barnacles on the end. And um, There's something going on. We picked up a couple samples already, and they, they look very crusty. So, we, so these are not necessarily the... Um, original rock formations that made up the side of this volcano. They're, uh, they're crusts that formed due to the interaction okay. of the rock with the seawater, uh, creating kind of a altered uh, uh, surface on the, on the bedrock. And 
what we'd like to sample next is a piece of the original bedrock material that make up the side of this volcano, this extinct volcano. And um, we're not seeing anything immediately that jumps out as a really good sample for those sorts of studies. Mm. Um, we're, we're, we are interested in the ferromanganese crusts as well. And uh, one of our co-lead scientists, Beth Orcutt, is um, studying those crusts for microbial activity. A couple of degrees to the left, if you want. And so we've gotten a sample for that already. Um, we do have partners at the U.S. Geological Survey that are interested in the nature and the thickness and the formation of these crusts in general. Um, but some of the primary goals are to collect rock samples that tell us about the origin of this seamount and the geochemistry and, and uh, volcanic nature of, of the uh, basaltic rocks that make it up. And some of those uh, rocks we collect can be submitted for geochronological analyses, which will uh, uh, allow us to age date the rock itself from when it crystallized from a magma or a, or a, lo or a lava. Thank you for that. Yep. We are here at Nootka Seamount. Uh, we will be diving. The, the plan is to dive for 16 hours and we are just about to hit our third hour into the dive. And uh, it's uh, about 3,500 meters right now, and it took us a good couple hours to get down here. Is that another C pen there? Can we get a zoom on that? Yeah, right. Is there something uh, to your right? Oh, yeah, oh, there's, there's a little fish. fish. Oh, yeah. Hello, fishy. Good egg. Quick, what is it? <laughs> I can push it up. Huh? Okay. Yeah. Unbranched bamboo. They look a lot like those sea pens, though, don't they? Yeah, the from skeleton, a distance. Anyway. The skeleton and the sort of like pink dot in the polyp is tends to be the giveaway on these ones. And the fact that it's attached to a rock, not growing out of the sediment. Yeah, certainly. Although some sea pens will do that. We'll do that too. The rock yeah. pens. Try uh, right. in there. If you want. See the tentacles on each polyp. That's a great shot, thank you. I did on the current. I have to stir up some dust. But it seems to be going down the hill the way the fish was going.
approach. This is Nav. Another 40 meters, uh, 40 meters at 060, please. We did have a couple questions for Fiona. Um, how deep can you dive for your when you guys do your coral surveys? And um, do you guys use scuba gear at all? Um, yes, we do use scuba gear. And I think the deepest I've probably gone was between maybe 30, 40, 30, 40. For deep? Yeah. With scuba gear? Yeah. How deep can you go without scuba gear? Oh, how deep can I go without scuba gear? I think the most I've ever gone was between 15 to 20. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love I love uh, free diving. Yeah, I had to do a lot of that in um, the northern islands because we couldn't bring scuba gear up with us. So when we were doing marine monitoring up there, it was about 15 feet, so it was constantly going up and down, up and down, collecting data in that area. I think you've got a sponge straight ahead of you there. Yep. Yep. Oh, yeah. Bolasoma. Bolasoma. Huakai. Huakai. Herc's shadow looks a little bit like a manta ray. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm enjoying this close-up of this bolasoma. See which way it's open, so that's a good and the bubble cam there, good indication of which way the current's coming. Come up the hill also. Yeah, we don't really get stocked glass sponges in the area and depth range I work at, so this cruise has been really fun to see all of these. Mm. Is actually colophagus, not bolosoma. Colophagus. Thank you for that correction. We saw some of these with a really long stock yesterday, reaching all the way around some, some really big boulders. It was really amazing. Stocks maybe well over a one and a half meters. Okay. Katachi Alfar is waypoint two. It is 500, about 500 meters, 480. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. I'll come back up the hill, I don't think. I zigged it, now I'll zag.
nice Atalanta shot. Gives us more of the picture. Some of the ferromanganese crust have a pillowed structure. Is that inherited from the bedrock? Pillow, uh, yeah. Um, I'm not really an expert, but my, my suspicion is uh, there could very well be pillow basalts here, but and then crusts that form on top of the pillow basalts will Look retain some of that of pillow this. shape and pillow right, structure. Right but too. Um, What's that? we also have this. Uh, it's sort of like and I always black get this tracky. pronunciation wrong. The boitrioidal structure to the to the crusts. Boitrioidal structure to the crusts are uh, similar to little pill <laughs> similar looking to like little pillows. So you get these uh, bulbous uh, sort of mounds, almost like looking like nodules Interesting. that are attached to the rock. Um, and I think that's part of the ferromanganese crust formation on bedrock. Could these um, be trails? Potentially, that's what it looks like to me. It could be something crawled around and cleaned them off. Are any of these potential bow rocks? Potentially. I think so. She's saying it looks promising over here. Okay. Yeah. Bridge, this is Nev. Four zero meters at zero six zero, please. Are any of these pokeable? Well, yeah. we don't want something too big, that's for sure. Uh, these rocks look pretty good here. Uh, we, bridge, how please big hold is that? position. It's hard to say. It's pretty large. Neg negative on that rack back. I'm please hold position. Hold down. I, I would favor this one or this one, but Val's watching. Yeah, poke that one there. See if it'll very large, too large, and nope. attached. <laughs> I like that one. Nice, dislodged. Let's go for it if you can. You can do it, Paul. This will give you some of the ballast you want, right? Yeah. See yourself picking it up in the heart. I zoom it at the land in there. Sure. Do you have any more room to come over a little bit, Dan? Or is that going to be a... Come on, Butterfingers. Pick it up. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Nice one, Paul. <laughs> nice grab. Pretty nice. chunky. So that's the uh, Maybe you're good for so Are you zoomed in? in? Yeah, we're zoomed in. You're good. Okay. I'm watching the numbers. You got a good uh, finger grab on it. Got okay. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's come wide. 
You might just want to set this down and regrab. Uh, if you keep when you swing around, if you keep the two fingers underneath the it, bottom, it'll go. Yeah. We happy with that? Yeah. Yeah, you're good. So you're on the hill here. So uh, when you swing around, be careful you don't hit the hill. Yeah, I was gonna try to keep the arm up yeah. like this. Probably need to put it in one of the larger starboard uh, compartments. One of the larger balance boxes, check. And is the ship still moving? So this is a good no, snatch and grab? Or? He's no, the ship. ship is holding position. Ah, okay. an echo. All right. Nice job. Come on, corals. Yeah, where are they at? We are on a kind of a steep slope here. It could be that there's a lot of movement down slope of these rocks and sediments. And zoom back out on uh, Atlanta. Don't still. permit them to grow very well here. Yeah. Says it is, but I don't believe it. It'll come up a little bit as well. I'll let her overtake first before the next ship, ship move. Uh, you can kick it into gear where it'll take several minutes at this time. So Roger. Yeah, that is bridge, this is nav. And we're not uh, stopping to look at coral. 40 meters at zero 060, zero, please. Yeah, I think we can cover some ground. Sea cucumber? Talk to, to the look at. Yeah. Right. Good eyes. <laughs> What's that? Thanks. <laughs> cool view on the Atlanta Talk us up your right plans. Now. Every time. Every time. I think we can. Okay, Jeff, you can zoom in there. Oh, this one's pretty cool. Do you, do you mind if I play around with the Atlanta camera? Just yeah, go on. ahead. I don't mind. That full zoom, is it? And there's a little sea star. Oh, yeah. Another Gonia Starid. Yep. Hmm. Biscuit. Yeah. Yep. Cucumbers and biscuits, anyone? <laughs> <laughs> mm. uh, oh, it just poofed out a little bit. Did it? I think so. Saw some sediment uh, e exiting. So exiting or was he spitting? Or maybe it's just brushing those bits off. That's the exit in there, isn't it? Probably. Nice. Yeah, you can really see the digestive tract in there. It's hard to s t see if it's feeding. Sometimes you see its little tube feet collecting sediment, right? Okay. Got a little delta in the bank there, Paul. Yep. Yeah, Chris is saying it's probably not because of the movement of material downslope that we're not seeing too many. We're just not really in the sweet spot. We're, we're sort of too deep. You just don't see that many down at these depths. Yeah. So, so 
far, just a few sea pens and one bamboo coral. Well, confirmation that we're right. We don't see too many corals and sponges this deep. Is the depth that we went to the bottom of the seamount, or is that just where we started? Well, the real base of the seamount is actually almost all the way down to the abyssal plain, uh, 5,000 meters. Mm. And, um, but uh, the the slopes that run up to the steep part of the seamount are fairly gentle. So um, if we started that deep, it would be a very long dive to get to the steep, steeper parts of the mm. seamount. Yep, thank you. And we started this uh, dive at 3,552 meters. I believe um, the max length of the max depth that Hercules can go is just a little under uh, 4,000 meters. Yeah. And Argus c and or Atalanta can go to about 6,000 meters. But because Herc cannot go that Sounds far, we, we don't send um, either. No. Yeah, we can send. Atalanta or Argus to those greater depths if, if Hercules isn't attached. And we do that now and then. Look at that, some of the dark rock over there. Oh, there's a little animal there. Is that a sea anemone? I think it's an anemone, yeah. yeah. Looks like it. Yeah, if we can zoom in on the, um, well, the anemone is cool, but the also these darker spots on these rocks are interesting. Yeah, let's start with the, Chris Kelly thinks there's a mollusk scraping mm -hmm. these, which would make sense mm -hmm. to me, so maybe we can find the culprit in here somewhere. Can we there's ask? something that's like shiny in the... There's something here. Yeah, there. right there. Looks like an opihi. Huh. Is this our mollusk? Is it a brachiopod? Sure. No. This is a different is kind of foot. It is at the end of the trail. Yeah. Interesting observation. It's just a very interesting huh. look for a mollusk. It is one. Could be like sea slug. No, Any seen thoughts on one like that before. Trails are. Yeah, so uh, mollusks have this really powerful um, character called a, a radula that they can use to scrape off rocks, so I think it might really just be scraping the surface off of these rocks and hmm. eating it. The footprint that this one is leaving is much different from the one that we saw on the yeah, other rock that we collected. Denser. Oh, look, yeah, and there's a little... Different there's trails. Trails. Maybe the thickness of it is the age of the trail. Yeah, perhaps. Doubt that. Chris is thinking this is, so we saw the other day a, a polyplacophorin, the thing on the rock that had those Let's little come plates. Uh, come wide a little bit. And this could That's be right. a, an aplacophorin, so one, one without those plates. Different group of mollusk. Very interesting. Slow motion power washing. Yeah. Look how far it's come. Look It'd at it. It'd be cool to get a time lapse. Trail. Yeah. <laughs> Hundreds of years. <laughs> <laughs> Finally cleaned one rock. <laughs> Can we get a zoom here? That rock is a really different color. Is that a rock? Oh. Mm. It, it uh, does look sponge? different. It's a rock, I think. It looks like a... Could oh, that a might be a... Could be a sponge. <laughs> could 
could be a Xeno Fire Four as well. <laughs> Chris Kelly just types in all caps. Uh, question mark? Question mark? <laughs> That's how I feel. <laughs> you want to poke at it? If you have tether to work with. Yeah. Can we poke it? Yeah. Why are we poking? The uh, rock. Rock look like any or sponge that doesn't look like anything else. There's a sea that we have in there too. Everything else. Am I uh, close enough for you here? I don't know. I can figure out where the manip is. This guy here? Yeah, just yeah. see. If it, is it a rock or a sponge? It looks rockish, isn't it? You can pick it up and bring it in for a close view. Huh. Huh. Looks like a perfect emu rock. Cement. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Where did you come from? Could have rolled rolled in place from somewhere else. I think we want to keep it. It's very interesting. Keep her? Hello. It's so cute. Let's it's look at the other sides of it. Roger. Art thou rock or art thou sponge? <laughs> it's so porous, it kind of, I mean, but a lot of the volcanic rock kind of. Yeah, we get these um, vesicles, vesicu it's vesicular, if it is basalt, vesicular basalt, where uh, the gas escapes. That falls in there, is it? Causing uh, bubbles to form. It's similar to pumice. Uh, it looks like the claw is kind you of can move along pushing if you want. it a little bit. Yep. Got bubble cam. Does so. it feel light to you? <laughs> yeah. Maybe it's a sponge then. Yeah, Val Val mentioned it could be a pumice. Somebody mentioned pumice. Uh, we do see that in these environments sometimes. Some pumice can float right after an eruption. Keep in mind, we do also maybe have a steep section coming up from Argus. Yeah, I see it. Uh, so we're putting in, putting this in yeah. the box, are we? Yeah, let's put it in one of the um, inner uh, inner compartments on right. starboard. Okay, Jeff, you can go wide for him. You can uh, keep moseying along there. I'll, I'll deal with the storing the sample. Got it. Bridge, this is Nav. Another four zero meters at zero six zero, please. Uh, I think I'll catch up. Got the wall coming. Lots of rocks been scraped here. If you just make that two zero meters. Two zero? Right. Bridge, this is Nav. Uh, can we change what, uh, that to two zero meters instead of four zero? We got it Same in one of the bearing. back ones, yeah. I what was that? I missed it, <laughs> getting put away. I haven't put it away yet. Oh, I'm oh you still haven't. holding on to No, it. sorry, we're dealing with the uh, approaching wall and the... Gotcha. Slowly. Another, yeah, another, another cucumber. cucumber. Look, there's... Oh, no, never mind. Oh, I didn't... Didn't notice that in uh, Argus sonar, huh? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's why you have three of us up here. <laughs> uh, let's see. We don't have anything in A yet. Is that correct? Yeah, you're correct. That's open. You happy to put the sponge or rock, the sponge yes. rock in A? Mm-hmm. Sponge rock, pumice stone. Touchdown. Touchdown, Spider Rock. The only reason I said that is because there's actually a pumice uh, cone of basically a little eruption. As a kid, we went there on a field trip and it was just all pumice. And it looked pretty much exactly like that. 
Yeah, in Oregon somewhere? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Central Oregon. Yeah, where is that? We've been there as well. Uh, it's just west of Bend. Yeah. It's a round bend. And then when Mount St. Helens blew, there was, there was some pumice and all of that, too. Is the gain on Herc sonar just way down, or how come we're not seeing the same feature? Uh, I don't know. Let me have a look. That's a good question. Are you good there, Paul? Yeah, I think so. No, it's uh, where it usually is. Frequencies. Huh. Yeah, we usually run it at 25. It's just the uh, the slope is ringing in louder for uh, maybe. I don't, I don't know. Someone uh, played around with the threshold, maybe. Yeah, you can see. I, I think it's just the slope. It's right. It's not really a cliff, right? No, I mean, there's rocks <laughs> right in front of Herc, so we definitely should be getting something. Yeah. I mean, we are, but it's. Looks like a little black coral down there, Bathy Pathies, but I could be wrong. That co bottom corner right there. And then. Did you just want to say bathy pathies? <laughs> yes, <laughs> bathy pathies. Polyopagon. Bolosoma. Chrysogorgia. <laughs> Hemicorallium. <laughs> Paragorgia. You're about to win this game. <laughs> Ryan's probably grateful he doesn't have to repeat himself a million times <laughs> now. <laughs> I'm redundant at this point. <laughs> A little fish, too. A fish here. Can we get a uh, zoom here? Uh, that's better. I had some uh, funky setting in there. I'm not sure what's going on. A little bit more. This is the whitest fish that I have seen on this expedition. A lot of them are usually like really dark gray. And then we had those uh, chana cops that were like red. Mm -hmm. It's a very bright, almost like glowing. You can see it swimming, but like just barely. It's like, oh yeah, camera time. This is my good side. Let's let's keep uh, keep an eye out for a, a, a easy grab rock. We'll get one more here. All right. Yep. I don't want to stop the ship from moving if we can. Yeah, we can get one on the fly. Yeah. All right, let's come right on this. Ready for ship movement? So this fish we're seeing is Lucicorus. Is oh, I thought we were moving. Type of. <laughs> no, we, oh, we just finished our last move. Oh, okay. Let's call it another one. Right. Yeah. Bridge, this is now. This one looks pretty good. 20 meters uh, at 060, please. Good eye on the sonar funkiness, Dwight. Thank you. Not sure what oh, was up there. Yeah, there you go. Wow, big difference. Still not exactly right, but I've lost interest. It's working. Yeah, that's fine. I think. Uh, fine-tune the adjustment later. Yeah. All right, Dan. What are we doing? For this big one. Right here. Oh, boy. 
It's a little too big, maybe. A it's little also attached. attached. Yeah. Yeah, we may want to look for, for more rubble. I think it's all stuck here. Yeah, it looks that way. Mm -hmm. Oh, we'll keep our eyes peeled. Oh, freeze button. Fail. Sounds good. <laughs> You're just helping me take off. <laughs> We have another potential huh. culprit of the trail there. Maybe we could take a look at. Oh yeah, yeah. Let's uh start zooming in. Get this framed up. I need uh, one of the lights on Argus here. I can't see the. Can we uh, zoom oh, in maybe here, I Jeff? can see. Never mind. On that white splotch that might be making these mystery trail. Skinny little sea star there. Doesn't look like it. Can't uh -oh. tell what that is. Hmm. Interesting trails, how they really yeah. clean the rock. Yeah. Itty bitty Some brittle sea stars. stars. Come on. A little red thing growing on the rock over there to the left. Yeah, that's a shrimp, I believe. Is that stalked crinoid? Stalked crinoid. Is that another sea star off to the left on a row? I'm not sure what that is. No, not a sea star. It's yeah. like sticking out. I'm not sure. Let's get a, uh, get a partial zoom on that. Oh, that's a barnacle. Huh. Wow. You can see it's cool. feeding appendages out really yeah. clearly. That's neat. In the scalpelidae. Here's some loose ones, it looks like, if we have time. Yeah. Well, I yeah. say that. <laughs> I don't really know. You get close, I'll poke. Any in particular? Um, this guy looks pretty good. Actually, I'm going huge some <laughs> big rocks today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the lasers really help. Uh, something smaller, I'd say. Uh, this. Yeah. Trying to get our Mini Cooper total up. I'll get you in a little closer, or you got it? Oh, that's okay. good. Got one poke and pushed you off. You can go. Just, uh, I'll try those. No, sorry. Yeah, get a little closer, that one on top of it, Swiss. Looks like it should be, but... I thought I saw it move. 